I am truly honored to be here. Uh, this is actually something really, really exciting for me, and, and I kid you not, and there are two reasons why I am particularly excited to be here. And the first of which is um, I really love what you all do professionally. Uh, I didn't realize that there was a career in design until I was about 33 and it was way too late. And I think that's probably a better thing for all of us that I didn't get involved. Um, but the second reason that I'm really excited is, I'm not sure you're going to believe this, but from my perspective, ever since growing up, you all live in arguably, to me, the most exotic location in the world. <laughs> it, and I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. So you know, you can't choose who, you're, who your parents are, right? You're just born into a family and there you are. And so I had a really unusual set of circumstances that I was actually born to a set of parents who were spies. And so, honest to God, real deal spies. And so I grew up in DC, but DC was home base. And so living in DC, like my next door neighbor was Cuban, the guy across the street was Japanese, the next door neighbor was Korean, we had Argentinians, Nicaraguans. I'm exposed to all of these foreign nationals and I'm living in these different places. I lived in Turkey, I grew up in London. So I grew up in all these places and everybody that I'm talking to is saying, oh, well, you know, we're off summering in Paris or we're going here or we're going there. And like, I'm the little rebel in the family and I'm hearing about Omaha. Waukegan, Des Moines. And for the life of me, for the longest time, I never actually got here. I waved from 33,000 feet because I knew you were down there at some point as I was going from one coast to another. So it really is a delight for me to actually be here. I get really fired up about visiting places uh, like, uh, like where you live. And yes, I've been in Omaha in the dead of winter and I went out and walked and I thought it was completely badass, but I think you've also done something wrong. I mean, you guys know that there's warmer weather south and you choose to do this. So you're very brave people. Um, so tonight, since this is a really um, a fun event, uh, you guys are really you know, geared up about celebrating, getting some awards. Uh, I think the appropriateness of what I'm going to do tonight will seem obvious to you because I want to talk about three things primarily. I want to talk about these things that you already know. So I apologize in advance if you thought you were going to learn something tonight. So sorry about that big mistake. But, but you know these things, but the, the thing that I found in all of my consulting and my work with companies is one, if not all three of these things wind up getting left out. And they're the, the things about content, context, and clarity. It seems kind of easy, right? Content, context, and clarity. The stuff that you've got, the way in which you frame it, and who you're talking to. And because it's Friday night, and it's an award ceremony, the best way to talk about it is these particular ways. So we're gonna talk about feet, right? Because that's awesome. Um, <laughs> The next thing that we're going to do is we'll talk about appliances, because you know where do you go after feet? Um, and, and then finally, what we'll do is we'll talk about contracts, because gosh, those are exciting. Um, but when I tell these stories, uh, I hope you'll, you'll we'll use them as sort of devices to begin to see where you are professionally, uh, where clients are in their thinking, and how do you start building some alignment so for some positive effect. But before we do that, I want to sort of bring us all together. This won't be a silly exercise. No one's gonna have to stand up or do any bending or anything like that. But what we'll do is just sort of look at something and collectively begin to understand and get our heads around where I wanna go. Does everybody recognize this, right? Took, pl took place really close to here, right? A little bit south. So, 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 so this is what? The Wizard of Oz, right? Everybody gets it? It's amazing. This is almost a 75-year-old movie, and yet generation upon generation, everybody sort of knows the tropes, the elements of this particular story. So you want to play? Well, what, what's the story about? Dorothy and a witch, great, great. Okay, that's absolutely true. 
Oz, it's about Oz. You know, so, so. Friendship, fantastic. Home, home, absolutely, absolutely. That is the key central message of the Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home, right? There's no place like home. So it's a pretty easily understood story. We understand this is about a young girl. She basically runs out. She meets an irate neighbor. She's got this fantastic loving family. And this irate neighbor really is angry about her dog. And then of course what happens here every third week, a tornado comes blowing through and she winds up in this place and then it's the adventure and she meets these people and we learn that The desire to have a brain, the desire to have a heart, the desire to have courage are all things that you have inside and these are things, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. We all understand the context of this. But if if, if you think about it, another way of looking at this particular story is this way, okay? Transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. (laughs) How is that wrong? Right? It's not wrong. It's exactly what happened. But this is the Quentin Tarantino version. (laughs) Right? This is Oz Unchained, you know? And you've got Uma Thurman instead of, you know, Dorothy Gale and, you know, Samuel L. Jackson. You know, I mean, this is a really cool movie. The idea here though is is if we don't really all collectively understand what's being said and what's being presented, it's very easy to take things really wickedly, wickedly out of context. So, this is a long, arduous, boring process, but again, it's Friday night and I'm not gonna drag you guys through a long, boring, arduous process, just a long, boring, arduous presentation. It breaks down like this, if you just want to simply frame this. Content is your stuff. When I meet with different firms and we talk about things, if it's an issue, if it's a product, whatever it is, the discussion becomes is what problem are you solving? The manufacturers in this room, when they look at the launch of a brand, when they look at materials, they're thinking specifically for a market. What can we do with this? When you guys who are supplying service to the end customers on a design project or on a build project, you're actually functionally solving a problem. So content, you ask yourself, what are the things that we do and provide through our service, through our product, that actually solves a problem? Context is your audience. Isn't it interesting how many times you come out of a meeting and you feel like you weren't understood, right? They just didn't get it, okay? And oftentimes what you learn is the audience actually is sort of speaking a different language or on a slightly different wavelength. And then finally, clarity is this whole idea of the language that you use, right? It's often said that generationally people are speaking two different languages. It's said that from coast to coast in the US people are speaking two different languages. So obviously this is um, perhaps communicated more elegantly in certain ways. Um, Who likes horror stories? As long as they're not happening to you, right? Horror stories are kind of fun, right? You know, something evil and bad happens. So let me give you an example of a company, no names, I promise, no names, but a company that basically gets all three of these completely wrong. All right, so about 10, 12 years ago, there's a huge, huge, huge healthcare provider on the West Coast in a certain state that's pretty big on that coast, Um, And this healthcare provider is looking at the world through a set of environmental glasses. They're realizing that they need to make some serious changes with regards to the companies they're going to be buying from, the products they're specifying, and the rationale behind those purchases. So what they do is they invite all the vendors. This is not a made-up story, this is a real story. And they invite all of these vendors to actually come out and sit down with them and present. Well, one of the companies goes out there and they're like, well, wait a minute, we've got to do something on sustainability. Uh, okay, what the hell does that mean? So they grab their OSHA guy and he goes and he piles a three ring binder together of all the basic state compliance information and he flies out and goes into a very nice boardroom and sits in front of a group of people and presents it. And the folks on the other end of the table are looking at it going, you're not getting what we're asking for. 
but you're a great client, we buy a lot of your stuff, go back and do it again. So they give him the opportunity and the guy flies back to the other coast and said, hmm, didn't work out real well. So they're like, ah, oh, what do we do? Let's bring in the ad agency. So they bring in the ad agency because this green stuff is really cool with the kids. So, you know, let's, let's do some of that with it. So they bring in the ad agency and the ad agency says, got it. We know what to do. A brochure, right? <laughs> the world is solved through a brochure. The revolution's gonna be on a t-shirt, the world's problems are gonna be solved in a brochure. So they, they produce this brochure. And you look at the brochure and you open it up. There's this gorgeous picture of the desert southwest. Sun setting, everything's glowing orange. Beautiful aurora cactus is off in the distance. And at the bottom is copy. And basically it says, nature rocks. We like nature. Yeah. You flip the next page over, full spread. Pacific Northwest, you can tell it's the Pacific Northwest because of the type of tree that's there. Not tree, trees, there's more than one. So out looking out from this bank, you see a, a jutting peninsula out and you see this gorgeous, beautiful whale breaching the surface and doing one of those incredibly kick-ass things that whales do falling back. I don't know why they do it, but God bless them for doing it. <laughs> and then at the bottom of it, it says, we like animals. <laughs> animals rock. Yay, animals. And they're like, yeah, we got it. We got this. This is totally us. So he gets back on a plane. True story. And he goes in front of the board again and puts the brochures in front of all the people. We know what you want. This is it. A couple things are missing here. One, this company manufactures product on the East Coast. This company's on the West Coast. A person looking at the document says, you have a manufacturing facility in the desert? Uh, no. You have a manufacturing facility in the Northwest? No. So what's the deal with these photographs? Nature rocks, animals rock. The best part of this story is at the same time, in Northern California, in the Pacific Northwest, the FBI are conducting a massive, massive manhunt for the leaders of the number one most wanted eco-terrorist organization that are spiking trees, maiming loggers, blowing up equipment, and killing people. Guess what name this company chose to name their environmental program? After the eco-terrorist group, by mistake. Not knowing your audience, not knowing your subject, getting the language completely, completely wrong. These are disasters that happen over and over again. Happened in your industry, happened a while ago. The good news about the company is they changed their ways. They wound up looking inside themselves, seeing what they could do, and then they began telling the community exactly what it was, and it completely changed the way they began to be viewed as a brand. By the way, that company that he went to see and presented the brochure to, that was a $20 million a year piece of business. They lost it for six years. Not knowing how to address with content, not knowing how to put it in the appropriate content, and certainly not being clear about it. But it's not only companies that screw this up. People do this all the time. This is actually a person that I know who's really capable. But if you can't read it, let me read it. This is a description of who they are. I assist people in product-driven solutions that resonate production, collaboration, and return. 20 bucks to the first person who can tell me what the hell that means. Does anybody resonate, by the way? I mean, not in some sort of quantum physics sort of way. Do you resonate collaboration? What is it with product-driven solutions? Why is everything a solution? I'm sitting there thinking, it's like, okay, so I have my spousal solution, and at night we sit on our seating solution, and then we enjoy the entertainment solution, and perhaps there'll be conjugal solutions, you know? I mean, 
Why? Speak English. Speak plain, plain English. So enough of the horror stories and, and, and some things that just seem pretty foolish. And talking specifically about companies that are doing this well. And remember, we're looking at a way in which all of us can start using language in such a way through this framework to begin to present yourselves and the services you offer in a more lucid, clear, and understanding way. Has anybody stayed at a Ritz-Carlton here? Hands? Okay, hands. Don't be embarrassed. I've spent a lot of money for hotel rooms, too. Um, what's really marvelous about this particular phrase, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, is it is trained as part of all of the Ritz onboarding on an ongoing basis. It's, anyone can build a beautiful luxury hotel. Anyone can put on 700 thread count sheets on beds. Anyone can go ahead and make your arrival experience great and your exit experience nice. And anyone can charge you a good $45 for a steak, okay? But the way in which these guys organize themselves, the context that they present their services, and the way they deliver it is absolutely mind-blowing. So much so that Ritz-Carlton is the way in which so many corporations send their people through the programs to understand true customer service. So a little bit of an exercise. We all went to school, we all can read. Let me ask you, what company is this? the organization that young at heart families with traditional values think of first when they're looking for fantasy-oriented films, merchandise, and vacations because they expect it will help them escape temporarily from their everyday worlds. <laughs> right, exactly, it's Disney. Who else could it be? It can't be anybody else. So when you think about the threes of clarity, uh, pardon me, of Content, context, and clarity. What is their content? Their content really is the young at heart families uh, building product for these people, doing what? Providing this particular service of orient, uh, family oriented films to do what to escape. Every Disney product that is out there fits this framework. This is actually an internal facing statement that they build and every action the Disney organization touches this statement. They look to this. This is the framework on how they put their material out. So remember I told you, I mean I know you guys are chomping at the beat to hear a good story on feet, right? Okay. So the three things I want to talk about are one of the items is an object. Everyday ubiquitous object. You've seen it, you've used it, you've forgotten about it. The second item we'll talk about is a retail brand that I think most of you all have never heard of, but you certainly will in a matter of years. And the final one is about an entire infrastructure system that you don't even think about, but it really annoys you on a monthly basis. So, this is an illustration, but does everyone recognize this guy? Yeah. Right. Does anybody, what is it? Measuring your foot, it's a foot measuring device. Does anybody know the name of it? It's called a, it's called a Brannock, okay? This little guy is like, I love certain forms, right? This little guy makes me happier than you can imagine. I own one. <laughs> I, I own one. It's, it's, it's in my studio, it sits on the floor, and people go, what the hell are you doing with that? And I'm like, let me tell you a story. Um, in Syracuse, New York, there was a store in the early part of the 20th century called Brannock, uh, owned by the Brannock family. Successful store. It grew so much so that about six stories. This was an institution in Syracuse. They had a son. The son was pretty frustrated. He was fascinated in shoes particularly, and feet. Not saying anything, but he was really, and thank goodness he was really into feet. What happened prior to the invention of this the way in which you purchased shoes, the way in which you went in and bought shoes, when you went into a store, the only device that was available, and it was rarely available, sort of like a stick that could go ahead and only in one way in your length and measure the length of your foot. And it was used sporadically. And this frustrated the young Brannock. 
And what he wound up doing is he wound up really thinking. Apparently, his roommates report that at school, at night, he would wake up and start sketching stuff out to figure out a way in which you could measure the length of your foot, the width of your foot, and the arch of your foot. Looking at all of these items to simply do what? To give you a clear picture and understanding of the actual size of your foot. So everybody at one point in your life, have you all bought a bad pair of shoes? You think it's great, but then you walk out and it feels like hell, right? <laughs> right? Okay, ladies especially. <laughs> but now imagine, now imagine uh, a world where half of the population is walking around on poorly fitted or unfitted and uncomfortable shoes. And in effect, that was the norm when the 1800s, and actually, it, it's crazy. I read about the industry in shoes and feet, and maybe I'm not like John Brannock or what his ideas were, but I got a little too deep into shoes. But it turns out that actually this device wound up changing an entire industry. This device wound up changing how the shoes were manufactured. This wound up changing how shoes were sold. You used to go into stores, and if you lived in a local market and went to the same place, they put your name on a card, and basically in inventory, they grab a particular product. When Brannock started using this to get exact measurements for people, the entire shoe suppliers would go to the store and look at it, and basically they learned that they could get a better, consistent understanding of how many of the shoes were being sold in a particular market, what sizes were the most popular, and so on, and so on, and so on. So popular that the Brannock Shoe Company stopped being the Brannock Shoe Company, and they just did nothing but make these guys. I've not been able to actually fully find the whole truth on this story, but I will say that it may have had effect in some aspects of the performance of the military in the Second World War. Because there was an admiral, this is a known story, it's in the Smithsonian, there was an admiral on a vessel, and the war has begun. And actually the admiral found that 50% of his seamen had foot problems. He had a fighting force that could not comfortably move around consistently through an entire day. They contacted the Brannock company. Brannock invented a specific one for the army that was two feet at a time. Did an immediate measurement, distributed the amount of pain in his crew's feet, completely went away. This became the standard way in which the military wound up measuring. So think about it. You've got all of this product, you've got all of these people, and you've got to consistently get a very pointed piece of information to affect a very serious change. It's an engineering idea of how these things all work together. Does anyone get happy over an appliance? Okay, there's one. You're gonna love, you're gonna love what I'm gonna show you next. It's, I, I geek out, I geek out over so many dorky things, but um, appliances really aren't one of them. I still love the Cuisinart I got as a wedding present. I still have that thing, and that thing's like 25 years, and I love my Cuisinart. Um, and I insisted that we were going to get a KitchenAid proper, you know, mixer. But what's really wild is the next company I want to talk to you about is a retailer. And it's a retailer that right now has three stores, and in five years, there'll be 34 of them across the country. Anybody going to Neocon this year? Hands? If you can, the, their third store or fourth store just opened up in Chicago. I would highly, highly, highly encourage you go see these guys. And these guys are a company called Perch. Perch is absolutely an amazing story. The CEO and his partner at Perch basically did not, neither of them come from a retail background. One of them actually owned, what, pardon me, owned was the uh, president of Design Weave long before they got rolled up and bought into another firm. I think it's Shaw. Shaw? Okay. What Perch is all about is if you go appliance shopping and you go to Home Depot and a Lowe's and you, you see what's being offered there, Perch starts where those guys stop. But what the founders of Perch looked at is they looked at all of the approach to the content that is the appliance market. And they saw that if you wanted to go up into the Wolf, to the Gaggenau, to the KitchenAid architectural series, those products in North, 
What you had to do is you had to go to a dealer, and that dealer would sell basically one of that particular product line and maybe one or two sub-brands. And it's very few households they saw that people actually had an entire kitchen built from that one particular product line. They also saw that the entire experience of going and buying those products is a little bit difficult because the salespeople are driven to actually close a sale, largely based on the fact that there's a warehouse sitting in the back with 40 refrigerators, 30 stoves, and that sort of thing. When you go into a perch store, there is no inventory. You're only looking at the item, and if you want to buy the item, you wind up getting it delivered the same way you would if you went to a dealer. But what Perch is doing is they've looked at this particular market and what the context that they're applying it in is completely different from a retail perspective. If you are someone who believes in retail and understands the retail market, these guys are breaking every single rule of retail. Space utilization and maximization breaks all the rules. Engagement in the selling process with a client breaks all the rules. This is an actual store. When you walk into a perch store, this is what you see. And the first thing you see is a huge, huge, huge coffee bar with a barista. There is a full-time barista, and the plan is there will be one at every single perch location. When someone at perch walks up to you, they do not say, hi, can I help you? If you look in the lower right, the first thing they do is say, hi. Can I get you a coffee? It is the most disarming experience that I've had in retail, right? I mean, it's really weird, but it's cool. And you walk in and you have a coffee and basically what they do is completely, it's not a disarming in some sort of deceptive way, but you begin to start engaging in this whole idea of not so much I need a stove, but what can I do with the stove? Everything that they do in there is trying to drive you to a position of joy. It's kind of a weird philosophy, but the CEOs, they're driven by doing nothing but imparting joy. And to do that, they learned that no one likes to be in a retail environment with a ton of crap piled up on top of you, right? People typically like that, and specifically when you get to this price point. Not only do you get coffee, but immediately to the left in a perch store, there's a full kitchen. So it's not like you're theoretically looking at product, but there's a full active kitchen, and it's a full active kitchen because there's a freaking chef in a white coat <laughs> And he's not standing there going, let me show you how this thing works, and you know, it opens. No, there in every single store all day long is a roasting chicken. Okay, now start doing that math when you do 30 stores, 365 days a year, and you're roasting a chicken, and it's not for show. When the chicken's done, they cut it up and put it out for people to have. Chickens take a long time to cook, so what they're also doing is they're fixing pastries in these ovens. They're taking cakes that are cooling and frosting them. I heard a lady tell the story that she had a little, ch uh, she had a little girl, a girl was seven. She had never frosted a cake before. The chef was like, well, come on up. And the little girl frosted a cake for the first time with her mom there watching. What sort of loyal customer are these guys making? They're looking at things in a completely different perspective. They're framing their approach to presenting products, and they're making it incredibly clear that they're driving toward a position of joy. <laughs> they sell three things. They sell kitchen, they sell bath, and they sell grill. The reason I laughed is because I forgot about the bath. When you go down into a perch showroom, and if you're really into actually buying a product, you can contact them, They will close the door, and they'll give you an hour, and you can shower. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable as I've seen a $25,000 shower head, but you know, um, they do have other, right, right, there's a $25,000 shower head. Um, it has lights, it has pulse, it has cool names. Um, Crazy. If you get to Chicago, go see Perch. But this is not an affectation, right? These guys don't say to the external world, we're doing this. 
They do it for themselves. This is the entrance to their corporate office. When you walk into Perch, the question is a little bit different. It's not, first, would you like a coffee? It's, hi, who are you here to see? Would you like a coffee? And by the way, if you don't want a coffee, there's fruit-infused drinks, there's teas, there's all sorts of variations. But the same exact experience from a standpoint of welcoming, this is what they're doing and they're bringing their suppliers. They're working with their partners, they're working on the land deals, they're working on hiring. Every single perch store that's opening, they fly the entire store of employees into their headquarters, put them up for a week, and immerse them in this experience. They're completely reframing what, again, you gotta go above the Home Depot and the Lowe's end, but they're completely reframing what that experience is. Did I just cut off? Yeah. I just cut off. All right, am I loud enough? Annoying, and, I mean, that's the wrong question. Um, they're reframing the entire experience for all of their partners and their vendors as well. And by the way, of course, you still get the coffee. It's just fascinating. The, this, the, the language on the walls in the retail stores are not about products. They're about potential, they're about possibilities. If you wanna actually find out information about the product you're looking at it, it's like a museum card almost. Very elegantly done. Last thing I'll tell you about Perch is I keep on saying they're breaking the rules, they're doing these things completely differently. Well, sort of how do you make this model work? Well, they're privately held right now. Year over year, their numbers are crazy good. And every month in one of their stores, they don't like secretly track you, this is not an NSA thing, but they take 50 people and they follow them through the stores. What do you think the amount of time is that the average Perch customer spends in a store? Two hours. It's two hours. Two hours. And wait till you see what the spend is. It's insane. But it's, it's, it's changing the whole idea of what that whole category is, reframing it in a context of the retail environment, and then driving everything saying that we are trying to give you not through product envy, product happiness, but what you can do as a result of it. And it's working. It's early, but it's working. So we'll talk about UN, our next st stop on the tour. And who in the room doesn't get excited about mobile phone networks and cellular contracts, right? We all love them. How awesome are they? Well, this guy absolutely thinks they're ah, really awesome, okay? This is an extremely happy man, okay? John Legare, who is the CEO of T-Mobile. What looks a little different about the way he's looking right now, okay? How many mobile or telco CEOs do you see at CES or a major conference holding a can of Red Bull. <laughs> I got Red Bull. Pink t-shirt, the Andrew Botticelli hair going on, velvet jacket, getting thrown out of AT&T's party because he crashed it and started trashing them. <laughs> okay. This guy's embracing Rebel, right? Well, why? The networks that drive our love, desire of smartphones, tablets, and all of these things are arguably, unless you're an engineer and a complete dorkopotamus, this is really boring stuff, okay? At least to me. These are towers, these are switches, these are overly cooled rooms, and they're dark, and there's a fat guy named Larry in there, and he always makes sure the button's going right. You know, this is not super sexy stuff. The sexy stuff is the Samsung Galaxy, is the iPhone 5, is the tablet. That's the fun part. So what Legare's done is changed the retail experience, and if you guys have seen what's happening in retail and retail design in this market, there's a huge change. And these guys are really doing some incredibly smart things. What they've done is they've taken the broad, broad content that is the boring aspect of these horrible things that show up in our monthly mail that says, you were on the phone too long. 
you sent too many texts. And they flip the entire thing on their ear. They've changed the context in which this product gets used. And the whole un thing is a really interesting position. This is more marketing, this is more advertising, but it's a way they're shifting their company. They're using a different set of language that's a little bit more than marketing buzz. And in the whole world of un, if you look at the bottom of it, it's the uncontract, unlimit, and unbeatable. Does anybody use T-Mobile in here? Okay, I was a, de it's okay. <laughs> I understand there's a place south of here that if you dare use somebody else, they'll come and get you. Um, the, I switched. I had been with AT&T forever. I had an all-you-can-eat original plan with the iPhone. They don't let you have that anymore. But when these guys came out and matched it and then did better, I took five phones over to them. By the way, I'm not paid by Perch. I am not paid by T-Mobile. I'm not paid by the Brannock Company. These are just really interesting stories. What these guys have done is they're changing the language about who they are. They're repositioning themselves, okay? There is nobody ever who thought mobile phone companies were interesting, sexy, and cool. And T-Mobile is changing that right now. I'm not sure that they're there, but they're presenting themselves in an entirely different way. They've reframed the con conversation with you, with me. Obviously, it's not working with you, but <laughs> for me, it's working. Um, and they're being really, really clear with this whole thing that we're the anti-company. And Legary will sit there and he will say it. We're not like them. They suck. <laughs> this guy is the most expletive-filled CEO outside of a boardroom that I've ever heard. They went ahead and they said, okay, everybody, if, 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 if you travel outside of the country, has anybody ever experienced you've had to use your phone and you're somewhere else and you come back and you've got a 79 or a $279 bill? Okay, it's happened to me. What they've done is they said to hell with it. Use it anywhere, no additional fee. That number behind him is $4.4 million. These guys, although they're still number four, they're kicking everybody's butt on conversion rates on a quarterly basis. They freaked Wall Street out because Wall Street loves the prolonged contracts. With T-Mobile, you can get out of your contract every month. You're not tied into anything. And all that guaranteed revenue that you're supposed to have in this financial model, they've thrown that out as well. And it's working. It's not working from a profitability standpoint, but it's working from gathering customers. And if you look at the ad, look at the, where's the phone in this picture? Right? Now, I don't know if you see TV ads from T-Mobile, but the T-Mobile ads that we're seeing on the East Coast and on the West Coast, it's like a frickin' H&M ad. You know, I mean, everything's cool and sexy, and it's black, and it's white, and it's pink, and you know, you got people going like, yeah, I rock! And I mean, I'm like, and then one frame for like two beats, there's a person with a phone. That's it, it's over, it's gone. They're turning themselves into this lifestyle fashion brain fashion brand. It's a little strange to watch, but it's working. And I tell these stories because I said in the beginning, I really love the work that you guys do. And the idea of the content, which each of you have a solid understanding of what it is that you bring to the table, is very much out of, out of touch sometimes with the context and the language that it's being presented in. So, the good news is, if you want to go get a drink or head to the bathroom or such, we're at the home stretch, okay? <laughs> so, but in talking about you and how this actually works, is, it's quite interesting. You heard in the beginning, I've done some work with uh, your colleagues in the national office, and there's been a lot of frustration for me, not with IIDA at all. Actually, that's been really, really fun. But for the past two years, because as, I, as you heard in the beginning, I'm starting another software company, and I'm working with manufacturers primarily, but I needed to understand what the flow was. How do products and data, and how do you think about all of these things? So last year, I spent, I went to five cities, and I talked to dealers. I'd never talked to dealers before. And I talked to dealers to understand how workflow happened. What was the conversation that they were having with designers? What were they having the conversation with clients? And then this year, 
I've been in the offices, six different markets, everyone from Gensler all the way down to little two-person shops. Talking about how workflow takes place, how the process takes, and this is working with designers, and how you guys go through your motions. And then I've been working with owner groups, and I've been talking to a bunch of different people in facilities, I've talked to VPs of HR. That's a very interesting constituent that's having a voice at some of these larger corporations. The HR director is looking to see what is it that in that refurb of a building or the planning, it's gonna mean for their people in retention or getting actually attracting new people or keeping people satisfied. And what I've learned is, and, and I don't have an answer for you, so I'm sorry, I kinda suck, but, <laughs> There's a gap here that's taking place. And I believe that one of the ways in which that you can start addressing this is reframing the conversation of design. The common thing that I kept on hearing from designers is a little bit of that like, well, they don't understand our language, they don't understand what we're doing. And I'm not saying that y'all whine because then you hear architects and after you get past the point that they're all gods, um, <laughs> you, then, you then hear that there's a gap there in how people don't really understand. Well, who's looking? You're looking at someone. Is there an architect over there that I just insulted? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, some of my best friends are architects. Lie. Um, there was one lie of the evening, right? You have to do one. The, um, the, 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 there is this sort of big gap right, there's a weird little language gap. And, and, I, and I, what I'm sort of like doing is asking you guys to put some thought as you go through, your, or not, don't have to, I'm just some schmuck talking to you at, a, at an awards banquet. But, but I've heard it consistently that there is this sort of like, there's two different languages that are being spoken. And I believe that your content is dead on and what you're bringing to the table is great. Clearly the importance of design has actually never been higher. And actually, if what I've been studying as well, and you're gonna see this coming out in a report from the IIDA and BIFMA have put together, that arguably the most underutilized innovation tool that business has not tapped into is design. You look at the Facebook story, you look at Google, and Coke just redid their campus, and those are huge megacorps. But let me tell you, the millions of dollars that they're spending right now is not because they're trying to be Billy Badass and outcool the next guy. Okay, there's a little bit of that, but really what they're doing is they've created the metrics and they've seen and they understand that the workplaces that they're creating through design will fulfill the needs of the business bottom line. My ex-CTO, bastard, left me because some stupid company called Google hired him, and now he's at Square. David fully gets this and talks about it, but when other people call him up, because he's really smart and people want him to go over, Square's office is way too cool. He's not leaving Square. They're fulfilling not only what he needs to do as an engineer and a really good one, but they don't offer the same type of package. If he went somewhere else, no matter what the money, his quality of work life would go down. So the work, I'm not trying to stroke here, but the work that you do actually has huge impact and does pay dividends for company. I believe there's a gap, and it's about articulation. And I'm gonna end by showing you, this. these are things that you're gonna start seeing coming out from IIDA. And the top one is the mission, the second one is the vision, and it says the IIDA exists to provide meaningful resources to commercial interior designers and their clients to advance the profession and enhance business value. Our vision is to support culture, solve problems, and positively impact the health and well-being of people's lives through a greater understanding of interior design. Okay? Think back a little bit about that Walt Disney statement. Okay? Think a little bit about the clarity that was in, well, maybe not quite, we can't do the Rich Carlton, it's not as elegant as that. But what you're seeing up there is some very strong clarity of purpose and language, and there will be further language, I'm told, from your colleagues in Chicago that are gonna start reinforcing building strength around these type of positionings to help you bridge the gap for more clearer understanding with your clients. So, Thank you, really. Thank you to the Plains chapter for the invitation. 
Thank you for not getting up and getting a drink or doing something much, much better than this. But um, I really appreciate the time. And since it's Friday night, it's award ceremony. Let me shut up and let's give out some awards, okay? Thank you.